So on. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I was just saying to Piers, this is the toughest. Um, this is the toughest audience ever, uh, because basically people like David Veal, I can bullshit the life out of David, and uh, he's an academic and he just sucks it up. Um, whereas people here, you really know what it's about. So I'll do my best not to be too BS-ish. Okay, that's me. Um, just to summarise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. You haven't noticed it? Well, that's just typical, isn't it? Uh, current and future situation, give you an overview of where we're at uh, and where it's going. Why CBT is like democracy. I'm going to be talking about psychological treatments. And there's only one show in town, which is CBT. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few of many problems, because that was my brief. Uh, I'm going to talk about solutions too. Um, the problem of delay and prospects for prevention, because in my view, the future should be prevention as well as a range of other things. Uh, the importance of understanding. I don't think I need to explain that, but I will. Um, how CBT works, because CBT being the only show in time, it's rather important to know what's going on when you do CBT. Um, so two inter, I can't spell, intertwined, yes I can spell, intertwined issues uh, for the future, development and delivery. So one of the things I'm going to be saying is we're doing rather well when it comes to treatment, but not nearly well enough. We have to develop things, but there's also the issue of delivery, getting, getting help or uh, making it possible for people to get help much more broadly than we do at the moment. Why IAPT is part of the solution. So I, I'm going to talk about IAPT. It's much reviled, rather like the health service is much reviled. IAPT is a wonderful, many splendid thing. Lots of things need, need to happen with it, but it is part of the solution, but it's not all the solution. And I'm going to give you a few buts. Uh, that's with one T. Um, okay. Here is a meeting. I guess it's the Department of Health. It could be NHS England. I don't know. I, I, I can't recognise the people in the room. Um, but what they're not seeing sufficiently is this thing called parity of esteem. I'm going to return to parity of esteem. Parity of esteem is when essentially problems which... I, I'm going to have to use the word cripple people, destroy people's lives and so on, are treated as in a different way. Mental health problems are treated in a different way to physical health problems. And I'm going to return to that. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is where, is where we have to go in the future. And I see OCD action as part of the solution because we have to hold people's feet to the fire. Many years ago, somebody said to me, um, you know, well, if you, if you were commissioning mental health services and you had the choice between somebody having a kidney transplant or having their OCD treated, what would you choose? It's the wrong question. Anyway, more of that later. The current situation, we have effective treatments, nice guidelines, again, nice under a lot of pressure at the moment. It's so important that service users, people with personal experience, organisations like OCD Action support NICE. NICE is a unique organisation. It, it's the envy of the world that you have this independent group of people looking in great detail um, at, at the situation with respect to treatment and making recommendations. So NICE tells us there are, two treat there are two treatments, CBT and SSRIs, and that's all. I'm going to talk about CBT because I'm a psychologist. And the other situation is that we have this thing called improving access to psychological treatments. And it does, it's done what it says on the tin. It has improved access to psychological treatments. And for some people, it has been a solution. For some people, it's meant that they've received treatment they otherwise wouldn't. But there's a problem. <clears throat> so, the other thing, which in my view is extremely important going forward, is the notion of evidence-based patient choice. So I think it's really important that people are able to choose um, what treatments they, they might be offered on the basis of good information, and that's access to the evidence. And, and think that's something, again, that organisations like OCD Action are able to do. <coughs> The other situation is we have stigma. Lovely to, lovely to see the stuff on Pure, lovely to see that, but stigma is still a thing. Um, and 
I am still in the position when I'm working clinically of when people say, should I say I have a mental illness or saying when they're applying for a job and say, no, I don't think you should. I think you should say that what I will say to you, which is you have an anxiety or stress-related problem. And it's not because I want them to hide it in, in itself, but it's because people are prejudiced and stigma is there. Um, and, and, and the stigma manifests in other ways. I personally campaigned for a long time against a Channel 4 program called Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners, which was a disgrace, which was shameful, and which was, to me, uh, the, one of the worst things that Channel 4 ever did. And I, I'm appalled. I'm still appalled by that. And they haven't wiped it out as far as I'm concerned. There's also the issue of labelling. And, and the research is very clear. The research is very clear that we do not know what causes OCD, but it matters what we say. So, if we tell somebody, OCD, oh, this is, this is a defect of the brain, then that does some quite strange things, both to the people who are suffering and the people around them, which is that, in most cases, it makes people feel more pessimistic, because if you've got a hole in your head, that might be quite difficult to correct. Now, we do not know if there's a biological cause of OCD. We do not know if there's a psychological cause. We do not understand the cause. But we do know that we should be sharing with people that we don't know the cause, that it's complicated. And I think anybody who's got OCD, if I were to say to you, hey, you know, the cause of OCD, it's complicated. Are you going to disagree with me? It is complicated. But to say categorically it's psychological or it's biological is wrong and it causes problems. There's some clues about going forward. Let me tell you a story from the East. Um, I'm very lucky in that I get to travel a little bit. I come, to, I come to Friends Meeting House, for example. But I also got to go to a place called Bangalore. Um, and, and, and I was visiting what might be the biggest OCD clinic in the world. I'm not sure if it's in the world, but certainly one of the biggest. A gentleman called Jannard and Reddy, who's a psychiatrist, invited me. And I, I got to sit in on... Um, some sessions with English-speaking patients. They very generously gave permission for me to sit in. And the one that I won't forget is a man who came in with a big bundle of papers. And it's your fault, David Veal. He came in with this big bunch of papers. And, and, and Gennard and my friend said to him, well, yeah, I see that you, you originally come from Lucknow, which is far in the north, um, but you've moved recently to, to Bangalore. And said, why was that? He said, oh, this is the reason. This was the NICE guidelines for, for OCD. He brought in the printout of the NICE guidelines for OCD, which David Veal has some responsibility for. And he said, I read this, and it was very clear to me that I have OCD, and it's very clear to me that the best treatment for me would be CBT. And this is a place, one of the few places in India where I can receive that CBT. And that blew me away. It blew me away because it, it, it basically said that if that happens in Bangalore, then it should happen in Oxford, in London, in Birmingham, in, in Edinburgh, and so on, that people should be empowered to understand what, what, what they might need and then, and then to seek it. And that's what I mean by evidence-based patient choice, and it's why I think NICE is wonderful. I think we also need... We have some improvements in our, in our understanding of OCD, which I think is leading to better treatment, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. We also are beginning to eliminate inappropriate treatment, but we're only beginning to eliminate inappropriate treatment. And we're not all the way there. I, I saw somebody recently, clinically, who had taken 11 years to come through to CBT. They had lots of other treatments, including four years of family therapy, and they were offered family therapy. Now, there's nothing wrong with family therapy, but this, this woman did not have problems in her family. But what she was told is, there's no CBT available, but we do have family therapy available. And she had four years of family therapy because that was what was available. Uh, and I think we need to stop doing that kind of stuff. We need to think about disinvesting in some areas. We also need to mind the gaps. I'll tell you what the gaps are. OK. Why is, what about democracy? Well, I love this. Democracy is the worst form of government, except all the others that have been tried. And in my view, this is just like CBT, CBT, it, there's all kinds of things that are wrong with CBT. It's not the, the best treatment imaginable. So it could be said that CBT is the worst form of psychological therapy apart from all the others that have been tried. The other thing is that CBT is very preoccupied with self-improvement, with, with doing things better, and that's very important. 
And that's pretty much not true of others, that the, the notion that things get set in stone because a particular guru says, that's it, do not accept gurus. Gurus are a waste of time. And I include you too, David Veal, again. Sorry, <laughs> picking up on He's not a guru. He's a nice man. Um, OK, the gaps. There are serious gaps at all levels of prevention. I'm going to talk about prevention in a minute. Prevention is the future. Um, we need to abandon the idea of hopeless kids. This is a really big gap. The gap is a gap in the credibility. There are therapists. You're going to walk in a room with a therapist. You're going to look in their eyes, and despair will look back at you because you say you've got OCD. And there's this idea that OCD doesn't get better. That's not true. OCD gets better. People can get better. No hopeless cases, but there are hopeless therapists. And that's a gap. Treatment in CAMS, again, it's been proving, but treatment in CAMS children, for children is, is pretty bad. And the, here's a really big gap. The really big gap is if you are 16 or 17 and you're referred into CAMS and there's a year waiting list, you tell, well, well we're not going to bother because, because you know, you'll be an adult by the time you get through to even an assessment and so on. And of course, then when you do get to be an adult, yeah, then you're not severe enough because it's not a psychosis and so on. And it's this massive gap. It's this horrible situation with people. And it's been there for years. We've known about it for years, and we haven't closed it properly. There's now a move to have CAM services up to the age of 25, but it's not there yet, and we really need to move that forward. So, <coughs> stepped and staged care with, with, with rapid step up. There has been a bit of a race to the bottom in psychological therapies, and I include some parts of IAPT in this where basically if there's a cheap version, that's going to be offered. And that goes along with some of the developments in digital health. Now, digital health, possibly a great thing, but as it stands at the moment, you know, a man, a woman, and their dog working in a garage can produce an app which they sell for 99p and which will be marketed. You can get apps for mindfulness, mindfulness colouring books, and so on. And sometimes services are saying, well, that's cheaper so we'll put that in, as opposed to that's effective and so on. Now, IAPT and NICE are currently going through a kite marking process for apps and so on. I and others have been involved in that. And it's not looking fantastic in terms of the, 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 the availability of those apps. And I'm going to talk about this again because starting people off on something that's cheap may not be helpful in the long term. It might actually be actively damaging. Come back to that as well. Perinatal, now we're beginning to fill this gap. Fiona Chalikam, are you here? She's not here, okay. Well, Fiona's going to talk later. Um, we're beginning to fill the gap, but again, in OCD, there's been a failure to recognise this, a and there's a confusion between depression and OCD in perinatal. That's a gap that needs filling. Complex problems, and boy, uh, uh, are some of the problems you see complex, but not necessarily... They're not complex cases, they're complex problems. And we'll talk about why some of these problems get complex in a minute. Oh, well, I'm going to talk about that now. Blake Stobie and I did a couple of studies. Blake did the work. I'm happy to take the credit here today. And what we looked at was people who as adults are presenting with OCD. And, and, and what, what, we, what we found was simply that, on average, people were beginning to show signs of OCD um, when they're about 15, 16. Significant interference. So that's the point where they probably met the diagnostic criteria range around the age of 20. It could be as young as four, and it could be a bit older, but not masses older. OK, so there, significant interference, 20 years old, first seeking help. Oh, that's six years later. That's a bit weird, isn't it? And then correctly diagnosed. Blimey, that's eight years later. And actually, first treatment, regardless of whether it's evidence-based, 10 years after it first became a problem. Now, for those of you who are older than 30, which is probably about... 20% of this audience, I'd say. Um, <laughs> what did you do between the age of 20 and 30? Did you do anything important? If you just cut that out of your life, you'd be okay, right? Everything would be fine. Or would you not be married, not educated, not have a job, not have friends, and, and all that stuff? And actually, having worked for many years now with severe OCD that has not been well treated uh, from the off, I'm now pretty convinced that I'm spending about 80% of my time dealing not with OCD, but the damage the OCD has called the human cost of OCD. And that actually getting rid of OCD is often the easiest bit. But actually the grief 
which I see on people's faces when they start to get rid of the OCD and then they think about all they've lost. Now, it, all is not lost, but, but still, to lose a big chunk of your life is very hard and to know that that was unnecessary is unbearable for some people. People are resilient and can come back from that, but, but treatment of OCD typically, from my point of view, is, is, involves treating the OCD and all the other rubbish that, that, that it, it's accumulated. So that brings us to the, the, the hot issue of prevention. Um, and I'm really just, this is just the, the sort of timeline uh, of anxiety-related problems. But here I'm talking about OCD. And, you know, when people are born, they're born with a certain amount of vulnerability or, uh, to, to OCD or resilience against it and so on. And at some point, people, some people will develop subclinical symptoms, which then make the transition into disorder, which will be untreated for some time. <clears throat> and then after, when it's correctly diagnosed, then people move into treatment. Okay, so that's, in a sense, if you like, the career. And it, for sadly, for some people, it is a career of or, or, or people with OCD. This is one of the places we need to do. And again, I, would, I just applaud Pure and, uh, and things like that. I applaud the efforts of people like Ashley Curry. There he is. Yeah, for drinking cider. Um, the, <laughs> <I> think, <coughs> in terms of getting it out there. And, 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 but I think there's more to be done. I think we need to be in schools. We need to be helping people understand you know, what might be going on. And that's primary prevention, just, just helping people be, be at the point where, where the intrusive thoughts are more likely to bounce off them. And then, yeah, then the next thing is secondary prevention. And, and, and again, Fiona Chalicum and I did some work with perinatal OCD, because that's a flashpoint, perinatal OCD, for mums and dads. It's not, it's not just the, the biological hormonal stuff, it's also that. And, and actually, that's a point where if midwives knew more about it, and again, that man there is doing stuff about educating midwives, we could catch people a bit earlier. We might be able to catch people within minutes of it starting and prevent it and so on. And the secondary prevention is when you've got something just starting or you've got the signs of it starting and so on. Okay, and then where we're spending most of our time these days is what we call tertiary prevention. It's not prevention at all, but it's like stopping things getting worse. And if you look back to 1966, at that point, the tech, psychiatric textbooks today were saying, OCD, intractable problem, all that's going to happen is deterioration, long-term hospitalisation and, and, and psychosurgery, and that's it. And you're basically doomed if you've got OCD. So we have got some tertiary prevention because that is no longer true. Um, and we need to do it better, and that's why we need enhanced treatment, um, earlier diagnosis, all, all, all kinds of things that can be done at that level. And that's kind of where we are, and we're spending most of our time there. But this stuff here, and again, I, I'm just going to go, OCD action, do this. Yeah, think about this, and I'm, I'm happy to help. But really, it's organisations like OCD Action and like Mind, and, and, and so we need to do it. And we need to also get rid of obsessive compulsive cleaners and stop that stuff. Okay. Other problems. Well... I've already mentioned this, too little, too late. Um, what happens generally with people with OCD is they get too little, too late, and then they don't get better. And then they're down as treatment-resistant cases. I hate that phrase, treatment-resistant cases. Like somehow, you know, you're like heroic French people fighting against the Nazis. You know, it's not, it's not how it works. Treatment-resistant treatment resistant means that you didn't get decent treatment. That's what it means. It means you know, poor treatment. Okay. The dog called Rover. What's the dog called Rover? Well, the NICE guidelines said um, that you need CBT. Dog called Rover is the dog. The dog, kid's playing with the dog. And <laughs> the, the, the man comes by and says, oh, what's the dog's name? The kid says, well, we don't know what his name is, but we call him Rover. In other words, yeah, the dog may have a name, but people call it Rover. So you go to have CBT and, and you say, well, I've read the NICE guidelines. Here they are. David Veal gave them to me, and, <laughs> and, and I want CBT, and says, yeah, hop on the couch and talk about your childhood, and that's CBT. And actually, again, we've done some research which shows that a lot of that is going on. There's also people who genuinely believe they're doing CBT, and oh my giddy aunt, boy, are they not doing CBT. We'll come on to what CBT really is too. So, so there's some poor training. You could, you know, on the internet, <laughs> there's a special offer. You can get a full CBT training with a diploma at the end of it for 25 quid. It's correspondence course, and you'd be qualified at the end of it. Not. Um, okay, failure of understanding. 
Um, failure of understanding is all over the place. And, 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 and I had a conversation with a very senior American psychiatrist, and I, I, I said to him, look, Don, there's, there's no evidence for a biological problem in OCD. Um, you know, why do you think there are? Why are you so convinced there is? He said, these guys are nuts. They do weird things. It doesn't make sense. And, and actually, a lot of people think that people with OCD are nuts. Now, I've been working with OCD for a long time, and I've never thought people with OCD are nuts. <laughs> they thought I was nuts, but that's because I put my hand down the lavatory. But that's another story. Okay. And there's therapist's dirty little secrets. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that. We've done a little bit of research on this. That therapists are so easily put off. You've got to be really, you've got to help the, the poor things. Because they get put off because somebody decides you've got a personality disorder. Whatever that means. And then therapists lose hope. You know? and, 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 and that, but often they don't tell you that's what's going on. And so that's their dirty little secret. A number of dirty little secrets. There's a failure to disinvest. There's a real problem that we're not disinvesting from, for example, psychoanalytic treatment for OCD. Whoa, I just want to bang my head. Um, tendency to blame the person with OCD and their families. I'm sure that never happens to anybody here. Um, but I'm going to talk about an example of it in a minute. In fact, it's now. That's good. I've got this right. Well, new stuff. Uh, understanding is key, and we're making progress. So, yeah, it's good. And what we're finding out is it's complicated. One size does not fit all. You cannot give people, you know, here is, you know, here is a few, th here's, here's some things to do, now do this, now do that, and you get better. It doesn't work that way. It's complicated. <clears throat> so let's talk about why you can blame families. Okay, reassurance. Now, reassurance seeking is something myself and a gentleman called Brynja Halderson. Uh, we've been working on this, a number of other people, in, Adam Radomski in Canada, and we've been trying to understand what, what reassurance is, and it's pretty clear what reassurance is. Reassurance is super checking. It's turbocharged checking. It's a type of checking that involves another person, and given the importance of responsibility in OCD, it's a way of diluting the sense of responsibility. And you see, you go along and see a therapist, and they say, you know, this reassurance is just making things worse. Guilt feeling, oh my God, I've been making my husband, child, or whatever worse by giving them reassurance. And so the, and the therapist says, stop giving them reassurance. Do you know what? That is actually quite difficult. And here's, the, and here's why people give reassurance. I fully support people giving reassurance before they start treatment and say that was the absolutely the right thing to do. Scenario one, you know, your, your, your son comes in and he says, mum, mum, are my hands clean? Right, you've got a choice. You give reassurance and say, yeah, they're fine. Can you wash them and so on? It should take you two or three minutes and so on. Um, uh, and that's fine. Then you go to school. And you go, he goes to school, you go to work and, off, uh, uh, and you, live, you live okay for the rest of the day. But, but yeah, maybe, maybe it's made things worse. I'm not sure it has made things worse, but who knows. Other scenario, you say, no, at the hospital they have told me I'm not to give you reassurance. So I'm not going to reassure and, and, and the little boy understands because, no, 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 but you've got to tell me. You've got to tell me you're my mum. And then this escalates. Two hours later, you're both in tears, screaming, he's not going to school, you're not going to work till, till at least lunchtime and so on. And, you know, you're, feeling, you're both feeling terrible, but you, if you're the mum or the dad or whatever, you feel particularly bad. That went well, didn't it? And you've really not helped the person at all. You've not helped them even slightly. So the reason that people give reassurance is because it's highly effective as a way of getting through life. And if you're a mum or a dad or a husband or a wife, you have an important job, which is to love that person. And by giving reassurance, that is the way that you can get through the day and express that love. Now, in the long term, that's, that's not a good thing. And what the person has to understand, that child or whoever, is that it's really important... Sorry, I just caught sight of a T-shirt saying mad. So, are you, sir? But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Sorry. <laughs> so that completely distracted me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, 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 the person has to be empowered to stop seeking the reassurance, but also at the same time to keep a relationship. And, and so where it goes is, 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 is the little boy says to his mum, I'm really, I'm really frightened. That bully OCD is at me. And she says, oh, I'm so proud you're doing it. Give me a, give me a cuddle, darling. And, and you have the cuddle, and then you go off to school, and so on. It's, and it's support. And it's no different from the fact that if you've got obsessional washing, we don't disconnect the water to your house. That would be bloody stupid. Yeah. And so disconnecting the reassurance supply is not a therapeutic strategy. So... So, that, and, and, and it's one of the ways that we as therapists have made 
sufferers and their families feel really guilty because we're blaming them, and it's just not true. Okay, the importance of life events. And we know a lot more about this. And genuine bullying, I had a doctoral student called Chris Furman, um, who's done a lot of work now on, on bullying and its specific effects in OCD. And there's not a lot, lot of time to talk about this, but some of you will have helped us with our research on betrayal. We just finished analysing, and it's, again, it's clear that being betrayed by somebody you trust is a very, very, or, or just thinking that that's happened, is a really potent trigger for OCD. And it then has, it ripples out in various ways that help us understand it. And it links particularly to something called mental contamination, which seems to need a different type of treatment. It's still CBT, but it's much more focused on the associations you're making with past events, um, as opposed to just feeling the fear and doing it anyway. So mental contamination. <coughs> Not going to talk a great deal about hoarding. There's a conference next Monday, uh, a week on Monday, about hoarding. There's only a little bit of hoarding, which is OCD, and it's, we now have a much clearer understanding of how hoarding is actually quite different in some ways, although for some people it's similar. <coughs> so we, need, we are acknowledging that it's complicated, and I think you know, we now understand rather better how psychological treatments work. So let's talk about that. Um, so, so, I'm just checking my time, yeah. We know that OCD is an exaggeration of normal anxiety. We don't know why that exaggeration happens. We just do know that it's an exaggeration of normal anxiety responses. Um, and it can therefore be understood. So my friend Don, the American psychiatrist, is wrong. It's entirely understandable. Um, we don't know what causes that sensitivity, and that is probably very complicated. It seems likely that it could be prevented, which is the best option, and it's easy, easily achieved here, but we don't stop helping the people who essentially society has neglected for so long. And we also know that the human cost can be diminished, um, and, and that there's a variety of ways of doing that. And when we do treatment, when we do treatment, we don't neglect the fact that, that this is not OCD as something inside someone's brain. This is OCD in someone's life. And it's not random, you know? I mean, like if you take perinatal OCD, mums have thoughts, dads have thoughts of killing their babies. It's not random. It's because, it's because they love those babies. And if you worry about stuff, it's not about good stuff usually. Ah, people can be helped. Once OCD is developed, always, but not necessarily easily and cheaply. And I'm going to, in a minute, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room there. Okay, so my best guess as to why, what the cause is, is this. Every, we know everyone in this room, everyone in this city, gets intrusive thoughts, images, impulses, and doubts that they don't, don't like are unacceptable, and so on. And again, they pure good. It's clear. When somebody has OCD, though, what this, this means that they worry they'll be responsible for harm to themselves or other people if they don't act to try to do it, and they get trapped. They, they start to dig their way into the OCD hole by thought suppressing, by neutralising, by trying to, be, trying to get the complete feeling of certainty that everything's OK, they're not going to cause harm, that they're clean, uh, and so on. And what happens, OCD is a problem of people trying too hard. People with OCD move mountains. It's just you don't see the mountain move. But, 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 but the, the amount of work that people are doing, they're trying much too hard to get rid of the thought, to be certain, to make sure that they're clean and so on. And, and that's kind of pretty clearly true. So all of that is true. Yeah, I think it's because of a sensitivity to feelings of responsibility. And my belief throughout my 42 years in clinical psychology is that OCD folks are the nicest people you're ever going to meet. They're lovely, lovely people. That's why I've spent 42 years of my life. Hey, it's not a burden. I've loved working with OCD, and I, I, I got paid as well. Um, anyway, what happens is that as time goes on, the solution becomes the problem. And, and the problem in OCD is not that you're that, that you're contaminated. The problem is you're trying to be 100% certain you're, that you're clean. Not that the door's open or that you're going to kill your baby, but that you're trying to make sure these things won't happen. It's the solution becoming the problem. That is the issue. So, how do psychological treatments work? I think all psychological treatments work in the same way. 
It starts from the idea that people suffer from mood-related problems, anxiety, depression, and so on, because they think the situation they're in, or what's happening to them, is more negative than it really is, um, or more negative than it needs to be. That's kind of a fact in our field. What treatment does is it helps the person to consider alternative, less negative explanations of the problem. That is what a good psychological treatment do, does. For that alternative, less negative explanation to work, you've got OCD because you know, you're, having these, you're having these thoughts, not because you're a child killer, but because you're a loving father. You know? and, and therefore, quite understandably, you worry about it. And so the alternative explanation, it, it has to be helpful. It has to fit with your past experience. If you tell me, Paul, you work too hard because you want to kill your father, you wanted to kill your father, and you wanted to have sex with your mother, half of that doesn't fit with my experience. You're going to have to work out which half it might have been. Um, it also has to work when you test it out. And it's not, trust me, I'm a white-haired professor with a grey beard. It's, hey, don't trust me. Work with me to see if we can find out what's really going on. Because good therapy is not about anybody doing anything to you. It's not about being treated. It's about two, can be more than two families and so on, but at least two people working together to find out how the world really works, what's really going on. Because if, if, if your kids will die because you haven't washed your hands, you need to know that and you need to wash your hands. But if, in fact, your kids are going to suffer because you're so preoccupied with washing your hands you forget to cuddle them, that's a different thing and you need to do something different. And it's also a collaboration of two experts. And the experts are me, somebody who knows a bit about OCD in general and how to treat it, the person I'm working with, who is the ultimate expert in their life. And I'm not any kind of expert in their life, but if they share with me and we share together, we can do them. That's, that's how psychological treatments work. So what's CBT? CBT is actually self-help with somebody helping you. Helping your? OK, I know, helping you. <coughs> I did them on the train. Um, so, so CBT is actually not... I don't do CBT to people. I work with people and they do it themselves. So I empower people to choose to change. That is what I'm doing. And that's a really tough thing for people to do. And the thing that is perpetually humbling for people like me and the other therapists in the audience is how much trust people imbue in us. And, and, and they'll, they'll do things if they're, if they're convinced that it's the right thing to do and that we can be trusted. They'll, they'll put their hands out of lavatories or they'll cuddle their babies or whatever the task actually is. You need to go to therapy, though, expecting to be helped to understand the nature of the problem and help to choose to change. So there is, there, is, there is a sort of receptiveness issue. But also, you need to go to therapy assuming that your therapists themselves are going to need a lot of help. And some therapists will need more help than others. The honest therapist will tell you how much help they're going to need. And they might say, oh, yeah, I've never done this before. Yeah. So, and, and that's good. It's a good sign. You know, it's a therapist who's... The therapist who knows everything, that's the dangerous sign. Because you know, they're, they're just going to tell you, thank you. They're going to tell you that stuff. And then the other thing is, yeah, often OCD is not the only problem, as I've already said. Um, so, okay, two things about how we're going to progress psychological treatment. No, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to move on. I've got, I had too many slides. No, 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 it's not interesting. Okay. <laughs> right, I'm going to talk about IAPT. Improving access to psychological treatment. And it's England only, and there are sort of vague versions in the devolved nations, but not good enough. <clears throat> OK, it's 10 years old now. David Clark gave me his slides, so thank, thank you, David. And it's transformed the treatment of anxiety and depression. It's, in, it's done what it said on the tin. It's improved access uh, treatments. About a million people are seen each year, and the average weight to treatment has reduced. It's all sounding great, but it's, I know it's not completely great. But we also know that there's a... Because that, that right now, you, if, if you, live in, you live in Scunthorpe, you can go on the web and you can find out how the Scunthorpe IAP's doing and how, how, well it, how many people are getting better and what the waiting times are. And so, so it's publicly accountable, loads of data. 99% of people go out to IAP. Now, filling these questionnaires, it's a pain in the neck but ultimately, it's the biggest laboratory that you can imagine. This is, it's set out to achieve 50% recovery rate. Now, this is all diagnoses, and OCD is not doing as well as some of the others. It's not doing too badly, but not doing as well. But back in 2009, it was achieving a, about a 38% recovery rate. 
The target was 50%. Last year, it, it got to 50% recovery rate of people coming through. And it's now exceeded that, and it's still going up because the services are constantly reviewing well, how they, what they need to do better. Okay? We know there are some things which lead to better outcomes. The one I want to point out to you is, complete, is, is um, problem descriptor complete. That means diagnosis. Yeah. It's not diagnosis in the traditional psychiatric sense because it's not actually a traditional psychiatric service. But if you know somebody's got OCD, then you're more likely to give them the right problems as opposed to social phobia or eating disorders or whatever, which need different things. And we know that that gives you a better outcome. The other thing is number of sessions and the wait time. So if you, get the, if you get a decent number of sessions quickly, you're more likely to do better, and so on. So this is constantly building, and it's leading to pressures on services to do things better. IACT is good, but more than 50% recovery in primary care and a million people each year being seen, that's great. 48% not recovering, though. And let's say 25% are not improved. So... That, this was last year's slide, with 900,000 people being seen by IAP. This means 225,000 people will need stepping up. They're going to need something more than IAP. So what we've done is we've created this massive, you're going to be lucky, mate, two minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> more like five. Um, so, uh, but thank you. Um, that means that people are going to need more. And we've increased expectations. We now need to deliver on that. And that, again, Piers, over to you. You've got to fix that. You've got to tell the government that, that if you increase expectation, you can't just say, oh, stop there. So more specialist stuff. Um, OK, and then here's the, what IAPT is, off, is doing. is a mixture of low-intensity and high-intensity treatments. I'm just going to give you, talk about one recent development. And NICE, I think, is revisiting OCD. And I imagine this will feature the OCTET trial, a really important trial. Um, that's the reference. OK, basically, this is comparing a wait list with computer-based CBT with guided help and a book with guided help. So a therapist, low-intensity therapist helping out. It's very profoundly depressing because, basically, the self-help treatments being offered to people with OCD as a prelude to high-intensity treatment don't make a jot of difference. It is not making any difference at all. It is not helping compared to nothing. Unfortunately, that is what is now being offered in a lot of services. But there's a, there's a twist here, because this was people waiting for high-intensity treatment. And what happened is that both of the self-help um, uh, interventions, guided self-help, reduced the likelihood people go on to further help. So it's blocked people from seeking help help that would most likely have helped them. And that's very depressing. Let's go back briefly to the elephant in the room. And I'm sorry, because I should have finished, but I haven't. The elephant in the room, parity of esteem. Some examples. Um, it's a principle by which mental health is given equal parity to physical health. And that is, it's, it's written into law. The 2012 Act said, said it should be. So follow the money. Mental health problems account for 28% of morbidity of, of, of problems we've seen. But spending on mental health services is 13% of total NHS expenditure. Look at the King's Fund report if you want to know more about this. Practically, this means that people in mental health are seeing people with, relatively speaking, lower levels of expertise. They're not necessarily getting treatment choice. And there are treatment cutoffs. So I'll give you a scenario. You have a heart attack. And basically, you go along to... To, 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 to cardiology and they start to treat you and it's not going as well as it should and they say, oh sorry, six, um, you've had six appointments now, no more. <laughs> well you're laughing but if you go for psychological treatment many of you are going to get exactly that and it's outrageous and it's not parity of esteem and it's not acceptable, it's not acceptable. Okay, the other thing just in terms of the future, I want to say better psychological treatments have evolved from good psychological research. We need much, much more. And what I'm going to say to you, and I, I'm biased, conflict of interest, but I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been doing psychological research my whole life, my whole adult life. Which is only about three years, I'm told by my wife. But, that's, <laughs> I mean, but no, for 40-some years. 
The amount of money that has gone into psychological understanding and treatment research is, is about here. The amount of funding that's gone into biological research in things like OCD and so on is about up at that skylight. Guess what? Where have we made the most advances? Have we made the most advances in terms of biological understanding of OCD or in psychological understanding? Well, I'll let you decide. And if you like, I'm very happy for people to enrol. There's a, a couple of, peop of people I'm working with at the moment. We've done a lot of research. We're always keen to get more people to volunteer for research, and we're now compiling a database of people who are prepared to be contacted, and that's what that behind me is. So, ladies and gentlemen, the future of OCD has to be better than the current situation. The current situation is better than the past. So there's a line. We want to go right for the top, and we need to, do the, we need to get to the point where we really do render OCD as an unnecessary disease, which is what I believe it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>